Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I am always thrilled when I can do, um, be at a conference like this, which is uh, only an hour from my home. Two weeks ago, I was in Mexico for five days doing some trainings and workshops. And so while that was a wonderful experience, I love to know and hear more about what is happening in Pennsylvania and to keep up with that. And so I'm very honored to be asked to be with you today. So thank you for that invitation and I'm very happy to be here. Unfortunately, I can't be here for today, uh, for the entire day um, because I'm leaving from here to go to Virginia for a conference that I'm speaking at there as well. So um, my husband always says to me, I think you should fire whoever does your scheduling. Um, and yeah, I really, I've had multiple people, colleagues of mine who have retired who've said that's gonna be their full-time job. I'm thinking about taking them up on it one of these days. So I want to, uh, talk today about restorative justice and for me kind of the framework that I do the work that I do for Mennonite Central Committee. Um, you could get a different speaker up here who may have a different framework that they use, but you get to hear me today. One of the things I've done is I've repeatedly said over the past number of years that the real test of whether we're truly doing the work of restorative justice is whether we can implement the values and the principles in our own lives. I used to think this was someone we did, something we did for other people, to other people. Um, but it's only as I think we, we talk about it in the context of our own lives that we can truly talk about the work. I sometimes regret those words because my convictions about that have been tested in various ways over the years. More recently, my faith community has been rocked by allegations of solicitation of prostitution by a well-known administrator who subsequently lost his job. I've read the research making the link between buying sex and being sexually coercive, such as a recent Boston study of 101 men who bought sex and 101 men who did not and found that sex buyers' perspectives are similar to those of sexually coercive men. But I was cautious not to make any judgment. I could ask questions about how we present the information to our body of constituents, keeping he and his family in mind as negative statements were made and insinuated, and always coming back to one of the values of restorative justice, that of respect that I hold as a core component of restorative justice. And then I found out that someone I love very much was victimized by this person. But her story was framed by those in positions of power as a mutual relationship rather than abuse. And I found myself suddenly unable to abide by the very principles and values I speak about at times like this, or at least not easily abide by those values and principles. I could no longer be an impartial, impartial practitioner trying to keep the needs of the victim and the offender and all those affected in balance so that we can more fully come to an understanding of justice. It's a work in progress, and it's how I want to frame my comments today. I've certainly learned much about the work from those who have experienced harm and those who have caused harm. During preparation for one facilitated dialogue that I did here in Pennsylvania between a woman whose son was murdered and the man convicted of the murder, this inmate told me that he was doing this voluntary, voluntarily, as all uh, who come into this dialogue do, both for himself and the murder victim's mother. He also told me that his mother really wanted him to meet with the victim and that she had a letter for the victim as well. I contacted the mother, the victim, and I asked her whether she wanted the letter forwarded so that she could read it. She was living in another state. She was quite astounded. And her response was, isn't this what we were put on this earth to do, to be in community with one another, to find the connections where we can? For me, when I think about um, fabric and how we use fabric, I think of putting, that this is putting a piece of prepared cloth onto the garment of justice that ties the fabric of our community together. For me, some of this transforming work involves the legal system and change that means asking some very difficult questions. For instance, how have we gotten to the place where, with 2.2 million of our citizens incarcerated, a 500% increase over the past 30 years, 
that the experience of prisons has now become a normal part of our communities. It's part of our mentality, in some ways, of our throwaway society. How do we address what we hear as the persistent racism within our legal system? As evidenced by those we are incarcerating, more than 60% of the people in prison are now racial and ethnic minorities. And we as a society make, a, um, we make a, assumptions about what that means in terms of who are committing crimes. Columnist Barbara Minor writes, has our criminal justice system, particularly in urban areas, become a sophisticated form of control rather than protection? To what extent might our criminal justice system contribute to rather than ameliorate neighborhood dysfunction in poor communities of color? And again, it's not a critique of our, list, of our legal system. Maybe it is. I think there's a, there's a purpose for our legal system. I think uh, restorative justice doesn't say abolish our legal systems. There's a place for it, but it means asking some really hard questions about how we do the work that we do. And then how can we assist victims in their search for justice outside of the legal system by instituting what Susan Herman of the National Center for Victims of Crime called parallel justice to address the needs of victims of crime separate from the work of the legal system does in responding to the needs of offenders. I think there are many, many opportunities for where we can start. I think education is a key component. A couple of years ago, I watched a documentary by Ken Burns and his daughter, Sarah, who told her dad that this needed to be written. It was the Central Park Five. Some of you in this room may remember the case from April of 1989. Some of you may not have been born yet, I realize as I uh, tell this story. It was where a young white woman was brutally raped, beaten, and left for dead while jogging in Central Park. Five young African-American and Hispanic boys, ages 14 to 16, were picked up that night in the park and subsequently charged, tried, and convicted for the assault, based largely on their confessions because of lack of evidence against them. Each of them received five to 15 years in prison. Thirteen years later, another young man, incarcerated at the time, met the oldest of these boys, who are now young men, in prison, and started telling others that he was actually the one who committed the crime and that these boys did not deserve what happened to them. All charges were subsequently dropped after an investigation, and the final young man, who was still incarcerated, on another offense, which is another story about his devastated life, was released. The, excuse me. The lawsuit they filed was settled in 2014 without any admission of wrongdoing for those involved. I talk about this because I think that while all the processes that we engage in under restorative justice umbrella are amazing and necessary, I also think that we need to look at root causes. We need to address root causes so that we can halt such devastating experiences as the school to prison pipeline that is affecting so many of our communities, particularly communities of color. We need to halt the revolving doors of our prison system. There was an article in our local paper last year called Crime Habit is Hard to Break, in which the PA Department of Corrections noted in its landmark report that 62% of state parolees will reoffend within three years of release. In the article, Lancaster County judge stated that we should recognize that in most situations, incarcerating someone for minor infractions is simply not going to change behavior. We need to get at the underlying problem. I think that's true. I think there are many other underlying problems we need to address as communities as well. One of the most telling statements from the documentary of the Central Park Five that I mentioned was the interview with one of the jurors who was a white man. He was apparently a holdout on the guilty verdict because of discrepancies from the police report. And his comment was what was so swaying for jurors was that the comment that was so swaying for jurors was that each of these young boys, remember they were age 14 to 16, confessed. He was amazed by that now knowing that it was not true. I think the first thing that I as a practitioner and a community member need to acknowledge is my power and my privilege and how that impacts my work. 
So as he spoke about those confessions, I know that he probably, like me, has a worldview that can't fully comprehend that someone can, has been, and will continue to be imprisoned because of the color of their skin. And it starts within our communities. And not just when a juvenile is already in the legal system. This is a responsibility, I think, for all of us. Not one where we can simply point fingers and blame someone else. We are all complicit in structures that oppress. Much of the work I've been involved in in restorative justice has been with schools and restorative discipline in schools. The reality is that we need to have schools be a place where students feel safe, and I use that term broadly, and cared for. In July 2011, there was a report entitled Breaking School Rules, a statewide study of how school discipline relates to students' success and juvenile justice involvement. It was by the Council of State Governments Justice Center in partnership with Texas A&M University. I did not know of a study um, to that magnitude before then. So it's unprecedented statewide study of nearly one million Texas public secondary school students. And they were followed for at least six years starting in grade seven. The Texas school system is 49% Hispanic, 33% white, and 14% African American. And here were some of the findings. 60% of those 1 million students were suspended or expelled at least once between their 7th and 12th grade years. 83% of black male students were suspended or expelled, even though, again, remembering they were 14% of the population, compared to 74% Hispanic, who were 49% of the population, and 59% white. 70% of African American girls were suspended or expelled, 58 Hispanic young women, and 30% of the white girls, usually for the same offenses. It was not a mandatory suspendable offense. That only accounts for 3% of the disciplinary actions. The data revealed that a student who was suspended or expelled for a discretionary violation, remember not mandatory, was nearly three times as likely to be in contact with the juvenile justice system the following year. Hence the name school to prison pipeline that we often hear about. And then there are questions we haven't touched in terms of victimization. Susan Herman, who I mentioned earlier, was the director of the National, Victim for, Vic, National Center for Victims of Crime for a number of years and says that in her work with victims, Here's the conclusion that she came to. While the trauma and harm experienced by many victims of crime is deep, debilitating, and long-lasting, our treatment of crime victims at every level, individual, community, and governmental, is ineffective, fragmented, and dismissive. This woefully inadequate response reinforces victims' sense of shame and isolation and a misguided belief that recovery is a private matter. A few years ago, I was at a restorative justice conference, and I sat with um, a Mennonite woman whose mother was brutally murdered when she was a young girl. And she said that in the previous year, she had taken time off from her work to travel and to tell her story, to write songs about her journey, and to participate for the first time in a restorative justice conference. She sang one of her original songs, and the audience gave her a standing ovation. She told me that this was a place where she felt safe as a victim of crime to tell her story. We shouldn't feel comfortable when we hear that. How many other victims would not feel safe in our communities to tell their story? I was also at a conference for victim advocates where the featured speaker was Trisha Melly, who the was the victim of the Central Park Five case. I remember taking a deep breath when someone asked her the question, how do you feel about finding out that the five young men serving time for what happened to you were innocent? I, I shuddered a bit thinking about the judgment in the tone of voice as if that were the victim's fault. She had no memory of the attack and she never identified any of them in court. She simply told her story. Her response was, I cannot let what happened in our legal system affect my journey of healing. 
Too often when experiencing their own grief and loss, we expect victims to also be responsible for the journey of the offender. And that is not a burden we should be placing on them. Our work as a community should be to figure out how to walk the journey with each of them, to do the work they each need to do. Sometimes that includes a face-to-face -face dialogue that I mentioned, but sometimes it doesn't. I think this broader work of restorative justice is one way we begin to sew the pieces together to form a definition of justice that is meaningful for victims, for offenders, for our communities. It leaves me with this lingering question of what it would be like if when a person acts in irresponsible or harmful ways, he or she sits with family and friends and others from the community who care about them and about strengthening their community and talks to them about all the good things they can recount about this person in order to remind them of who they really are. I'm reminded of this each time I sit with someone who has harmed another and says, I will be remembered for the worst thing I have ever done and not for anything good I have done. I do worry about how trite that sounds and I know life is more complicated than that, but it's where, as a restorative justice practitioner, I think I need to start this lifelong process of building healthy relationships that I can only hope leads to healthy community building. I've had moments where I've practiced this in my personal life and many more times where I've fallen far, far short, as in my opening story that's still in progress. I remember having a conversation with Howard Zare, who was the editor of the Little Books of Justice and Peace Building series, and he asked whether I'd consider doing a little book of restorative justice for parents. And I remember laughing and told him there was no way that was ever happening. I remember sharing that conversation with Solomon, who was then in college, our oldest son, on our way back from picking him up at spring break. And he said, Mom, do you think you've done such a bad job with us that you couldn't do that? Because I think you could. I told him that was more about me than him and his brother and sister. They've turned out great in spite of my parenting and thanks to my co-parenting spouse. I just thought I needed a lot more therapy before embarking on that one. I know in the bottom of my heart that I have to stop saying, but I don't like to take my work home with me. Taking it home with me is really where we all need to start. Part of that heart work also means acknowledging that the history of restorative justice did not start within a white middle class community, even though we sometimes talk about those roots when we tell the story. Indigenous people, not only in the US, but around the world, talk about the very processes we seek to implement as part of their worldview. They don't necessarily use language of restorative justice because how would we define restorative justice is what they practice within their indigenous cultures. Many of those practices have been lost to colonization, but our indigenous colleagues have taught us what we know about restorative justice practices, and not to recognize that would be perpetuating a re-victimization that we say is inherently wrong in all that we do. Um, I remember when I asked one of my colleagues who is from First Nations of Canada, um, we were looking to, uh, in our newsletter, talk about a column, a restorative justice column, and we wanted to use different names to describe that, and so I asked him what they, he would have used, what would the words have been in his, um, in his community for restorative justice, and he thought for a while, and he said, I don't know, he said, I need to talk to some elders about that, and he came back to me, and he said, they said, we don't have a word for restorative justice, it's how we live our life. So we, you know, we, we like to put things in boxes, um, so how do we uh, talk about restorative justice as a framework and a way of life and not just boxes of programs that we do? I do believe that restorative justice principles and processes call us to be better people both individually and collectively, and only by doing our own work will we find those ways to strengthen rather than weaken our communities as we find ways to engage across the traditional boundaries we've set up for ourselves and to acknowledge the power and privilege within our communities, who has it and who does not. Yet I believe restorative justice principles hold transformation as a value, transformation of people, of systems, of structures that oppress, which then allow us to hope for a future 
that looks drastically different from the current experience of many within our society and within our communities. And to achieve that transformation, as I mentioned earlier, I think we must constantly educate ourselves and build that educational piece into all that we do. I believe that educational piece includes learning about the history of the people in this country that was not taught in our history books. It means hearing from people like Joy DeGruy, who I had the privilege of listening to last Friday night at a Pendle Hill conference. She talked about the post-traumatic slave syndrome and America's legacy of enduring injury and healing. It means understanding the generational trauma for Native Americans in this country as a result of decimating their people and putting their children into residential schools where the mandate was kill the Indian, save the child. Understanding the history of structural violence is where we begin to learn how to become whole. We've talked about some of the specific needs and the responses of communities of victims and offenders, and the question then becomes, how does all this fit into restorative justice? There's not one agreed upon definition of restorative justice. I know that um, sometimes people wish that there were. I don't know, uh, as a group, that we could all come to that kind of collective understanding. But we talk about values and we talk about principles. But one of the things that uh, some of my colleagues and I came up with was this. Restorative justice provides a framework and approaches to ensure all people are treated with dignity and respect as we seek to be in community with one another. These approaches empower us to be responsible for our actions and provide ways of holding one another accountable as we live and work together. I believe the framework of restorative justice provides us with ways of living together. And we summarized uh, some principles that we talk about in the work and how we do it. The, the first one that I mentioned, that all people should be treated with dignity and respect, recognizing that each person has some piece of the truth. The reality is that over 600,000 inmates will be returning to our communities this coming year, and they are likely not going to be treated with dignity and respect. They are often unable to find affordable housing, a job, or housing. They may not be able to obtain government funding to assist them in putting a stable life together. And as we heard earlier, a minimum of a third of them will be welcomed back into our prison system. And at the same time, victims of crime often feel like second-class citizens. they are questions about the emotions they've experienced as a result of the crime. They often feel guilty for those emotions, and they often feel left out of the process of justice as they define it based on their own needs. They're told by family and friends when it is time to move on, no matter where they may be on that journey of healing. A second principle is that each of us needs to be responsible for our own actions and need to be held accountable for those actions. I think one of the things we need to avoid doing is equating punishment with, with accountability. I think punishment is often something we do to someone that can alleviate them having to take responsibility for their actions. Do the crime, do the time. Accountability is being willing to face the person or persons that we've actually harmed and figuring out what it means to make amends. And for me, that goes beyond taking the punishment. Another principle is that by our presence, we are all members of communities and therefore connect it to one another. I remember my daughter, who is now a young adult, she was in middle school and she came home and she told me about some of her friends who had recently gotten into trouble with the police for breaking into a home owned by one of our local churches. I live in a very small community, Akron, Pennsylvania. As I explained when Betsy asked Akron, Ohio, that Akron, there are about 3,000 of us. I consider that a pretty small community. So I decided to call our local police chief he was new to the community, and I asked him what he was planning to do with this case. Even though I may travel around the country and the world, uh, it was embarrassing to know that he had no idea what I did and what a victim offender dialogue program in our county looked like, even though it had been already in operation for about 15 years. So he had no idea this existed, and he had already made the referral to the county prosecutor's office. 
I explained a bit more about the benefit of handling these community matters at the local level, local level and that we had the capacity to do so. The youth continued through the legal process, which took another two and a half months, and then they came back to the local program. A colleague and I facilitated the dialogue between seven juveniles, their parents, and five members from the church community. The overwhelmingly consistent question from each family in the church was, why didn't we deal with this through this program before it took so long to go through the legal system, given the facts that lots of rumors and negative comments had been circulating all over town, doing much more damage than actually what the boys had done by breaking into the house. A fourth principle that I want to talk about is recognizing that forgiveness is a process that allows all people to walk at their own pace. I specifically talk about this often within my faith community when I do these talks because often restorative justice and forgiveness is seen uh, to go hand in hand. And I think we need to understand the comment that, all, that forgiveness is a process. It is not an event, it's a journey. I have a 2020 video that I used to use uh, for training purposes of a victim offender burglary and it was for community volunteers for who that wanted to uh, facilitate dialogues with victims and offenders at the community level. One of the most significant moments for me is when the family is meeting with the offender and the father is speaking to the offender about the look on the faces of his two small children when they saw the utter destruction, $20,000 of damage, as they walked into their house following vacation. His comment was, and it's probably the look on their faces that will keep me from forgiving you for what you have done. We can invite people to a process that, they, that may be healing for them, or at least satisfactory for them, but we cannot dictate the outcome of any process. We can simply walk the journey with them. One of the other things that I hear is uh, uh, used with restorative justice, again, within my faith community in particular, and probably within others, is the idea of reconciliation. And I think that restorative justice can provide opportunities, but again, it doesn't dictate the outcome. So as a member of the Mennonite faith, I can tell you that reconciliation is a really important word for us. We like to have things wrapped up in neat packages with the label reconciliation. And I believe in providing opportunities for reconciliation to take place. It's part of the work that I do. But again, as with forgiveness, we cannot dictate or predict reconciliation. I also believe that restorative justice calls us not only to think about reconciliation for victims and for offenders, but within our own lives. We all know how difficult it is to deal with conflict within our own families of origin, hence the comment of not taking our, my work home with me. I was asked to talk earlier this spring in one of our Mennonite churches about interpersonal conflict. I told them that my family of origin, there are eight children, and we've learned over the years that we never talk about religion or politics at family gatherings so that we can continue to love each other. And my dad was a pastor for 50 years. So, but the reality is that we do need to be willing to work within our own lives to deal with the harms before we can offer opportunities to others. We often say that restorative justice is not just mediation, not just a particular program like dialogues or circles. It's definitely not a quick fix nor is it a replacement for the legal system. It's value-based. Howard Zare often talks about the values of respect, relationship, and responsibility. He says he likes the alliteration because he, as he gets older, it helps him to remember them. And he says those are being core to the framework, but I think there are others equally important, like transparency and interconnectedness and self-determination that we also have to keep in mind. Just as important are the questions we ask that guide our work, such as who has been hurt, what are their needs, and how can those needs be met? It's not just about rule breaking or law breaking, but it's also about relationship and who has been harmed. We should also ask who should be involved in determining what happens next. 
And finally, what are causes? And how can we address those causes rather than just symptoms? I think that while restorative justice has come to be known within our society as a response to crime, that we also need to start asking the question, can restorative justice move beyond the criminal justice context and be applied as a way of living together in our work, communities, and globally? Perhaps we should listen to the Wendell Berry quote that says, it may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work. And when we no longer know which way to go, we have begun our real journey. And I believe that until we're willing to look at the barriers that weaken our communities, of looking at the world through a lens of interconnectedness, and secondly, of moving away from the idea of redemptive violence to the transformational and relational understanding of human relationships, that we will find it difficult to, for, form, to fully embrace restorative justice values and principles. But I do believe there's hope. One hope is that we continue to ask the questions within our communities based on needs of all of our members, that we continue to ask whether whatever programs or practices we implement are strengthening or weakening our communities. I think we need to look at what are the unintended consequences of what we often see as our good behaviors and our good practices. There's an excerpt from a sermon that I've used. It was written by a European Unitarian minister, Dr. Patrick O'Neill. And I also noticed when I bought Joy DeGruy's book last week, um, talking about the post-traumatic uh, slave, save, slave um, syndrome, that she also puts this in the opening of her book. But I think it's something that we need to take to heart. And so the name of this excerpt from this sermon by Dr. Patrick O'Neill, who was at the first parish at Framingham, Massachusetts, and he gave this sermon in 1991, says, and how are the children? Among the most accomplished and fabled tribes of Africa, no tribe was considered to have warriors more fearsome or more intelligent than the mighty Maasai. It is perhaps surprising then to learn the traditional greeting that passed between Maasai warriors, Kassirian and Jira. One would always say to another, it means, and how are the children? It is still the traditional greeting among the Maasai acknowledging the high value that the Maasai always place on their children's well-being. Even warriors with no children of their own would always give the traditional answer, all the children are well. Meaning, of course, that peace and safety prevail. The priorities of protecting the young, the powerless, are in place. That Maasai people have not forgotten its reason for being its proper functions, and its responsibilities. All the children are well. It means that life is good. It means that the daily struggles of existence, even among poor people, do not preclude proper caring for its young. I wonder how it might affect our consciousness of our own children's welfare if, in our culture, we took to greeting each other with the same daily question, and how are the children? I wonder if we heard that question and passed it along to each other a dozen times a day, if it would begin to make a difference in the reality of how children are thought of and cared for in this country. I wonder if every adult among us, parent and non-parent alike, felt an equal weight for the daily care and protection of all the children in our town, in our state, in our country. I wonder if we could truly say without any hesitation, the children are well. Yes, all the children are well. What would it be like if the president began every press conference, every public appearance by answering the question, and how are the children, Mr. President? If every governor of every state had to answer the same question at every press conference, and how are the children, Governor? Are they all well? Wouldn't it be interesting to hear their answers? May it be so for all of us. Thank you. I was asked to give time for questions. 
um, or comments that you have that you want to bring, so feel free to do that. May we suggest that you use the microphones when they are turned on? Thank you, absolutely. I hope that's something that's uh, further discussed today. And we could substitute many words in there when we ask about the children, but certainly we want to keep those uh, incarcerated who are aging as well. Yes, Mary in the back. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who didn't hear, she wanted a copy of my speech. I don't know, are you, are you going to like wallpaper your, one of the walls with it? Because, yeah, okay. Um, you know, the thing about giving speeches, what, what I found over the years, and yes, I'm happy to give you, have you have, you have a copy of that. Um, it's the same as when uh, reading and writing, writing books, uh, um, the publishers had such a hard time getting me to finish it. And I think part of it is because when it's down on paper, then it's like, that's it forever. Um, and what if I change my mind about something? Then you have these words, so I'm just putting that out there, just as a caution. I might change my mind if I came back in a couple years and might say something completely different, so just be aware of that. But yes, thank you. And your second comment was if, all, if we, you were a public school teacher and if everyone asked that question, who worked with kids, that it would look very different in our school systems, yes. Okay, there are hands all over the place. Somebody just stand up. Oh, somebody has the mic. Adults in prison and, and once you're sort of justice, I think no one's deciding to give money back. 
You know, it, I know the rationale from what I've heard over the years. The question is how it's being, uh, it's an easier sell with juveniles, but more difficult when someone is um, an adult and looking at our adult system. You know, it's interesting because when I first started um, my work, we, we were, so this was 30 some years ago, back when I was 12 when I started. Um, <laughs> We, we worked equally with adults and juveniles, and it wasn't a question, it was absolutely we do both. And so that argument actually came later that no, we're only gonna, we're gonna try this with juveniles, and if it works, then we'll see. But the reality is then in many communities where it starts just working with juveniles, it never moves beyond that. And I think part of it is, well, we think that with the youth, uh, we have more of an opportunity to change them, to lead them in the right direction, and with, with adults, they're like a hopeless cause. I, I think that's really sad because I think all of us are capable of change at any level. So to assume that adults don't either won't change or don't have that capacity for engaging in the same way that we think juveniles do, I, I personally have never seen that. And I think we should be equally funding both. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, absolutely. There are a couple hands over here that have been up. And I think we'll just maybe take these two questions because I know we have to move on. So these two right here. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you so much for a wonderful liberation and very informative. My name is Dennis Graham. I'm originally from Uganda and for eight years I worked in conflict resolution, peace building and restorative justice. And when I came to the United States, that was uh, when my conflict resolution work was put to rest. Mm. That brings me to my question. A lot of restorative justice system, in my experience, whether it be the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, the Dead Judges System in Rwanda, the Genocide, and many others, the application draws a lot of strength from the society of cultural practice. Because they already have a system, mm -hmm. they just need the help of restorative justice mm -hmm. principle to help them uh, engage society in a way that can allow societal healing after a crime has been committed. However, in all those places, most times, their society is not as highly litigious mm -hmm. as the Western world or the of the economy of the United States, Canada, and many other countries in Europe, uh, which I really applaud the courage you have for what you do, because I can see how difficult it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just wondering, how can we bring to bear the fruit of restorative justice in a society where the confidence in forgiveness And if I had the answer to that, they'd be paying me a lot more. <laughs> but, but it's true, I think. Uh, yeah, we have a hard time doing that in our society. And I think, um, I think it, it, it's why I continue to talk about the education. It's why I continue to talk about how we work at this at the community levels and not assume it's something up there that we can't attain. Because I think that's where we have to start it. And I think we do have to start it within ourselves so that we can get to that point that um, we're operating it under those same kind of ways that we do see in other communities and societies and in indigenous cultures that we haven't been able to do. So thank you for that comment. Well, on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank Lorraine for a, a speech, a talk that I found very challenging. challenging. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you very much. Let's, let's